Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You are going to listen to a telephone conversation between a caller and a call center operator. As you listen, Complete the numbered spaces in the identification form in the book. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Platinum Card Service, Rebecca speaking. How may I help you? I've got a few problems with my credit card account. OK. What is your credit card number? Mm, let's see. It's here somewhere. Ah, here it is. Can I just take the card number, please? Yes, it's 6992... 6992... 3443... 3443... 1147... 1147... 8921... 8921... Right. Can I just check that? Um, 6992... 3443... 1147... 8921. That's it. And your name? Carlos de Silva. I just need to check a few details for identification and security, if you'll bear with me. That's OK. And what's your postcode? SE18PB. SE18PB. That's it. Foxhall Close, London? Yes, that's right. And the house number? Um, 43. And can you give me your date of birth? 13th of the 7th, 63. And one further check, if I may. Can you give me your mother's maiden name? Yes, it's Moore. Is that M-O-O-R-E? Yes, that's it. Before the caller and operator continue their telephone conversation, look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. For these questions, there are three alternatives, A, B and C. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the correct letter. Yes. Now, can we get on with this? Yes, sir, certainly. I'm sure you'll appreciate that all these checks are necessary for security reasons. So, what exactly is the problem? Problems. OK. Well, first, um, your computer seems to have gone mad. I sent you £500, and on the statement for the account, it shows that I only paid 300 Yes. The account does only show £300 was paid. Well... I paid the £500 in at the bank, and I have my receipt, and my bank statement shows that £500 has been taken from my account. Oh, I see. What I'll do is check with the bank and see what they say. OK. You said there was something else? Yes, as if that wasn't enough. My account shows that £107.27 was paid to a company called Pan Express. I don't know who this is. Let's have a look. Well, 
it is genuine. I can assure you it's not mine. It was made on the evening of the 12th of May. Maybe it's a restaurant bill you forgot about? There's no way that... Oh, oh wait, hold on. Yes. Oh, uh, it's OK. I've just realised what it is. It is a restaurant bill. Um, the name of the company is different from the name of the restaurant. My mistake. I'm sorry. That's OK. Was there anything else? I don't know if I dare. What is it, anyway? Um, well, it's, um... The amount of interest seems to have gone up. Hmm. If you look at your statement for April, you'll see that the rate went down from 16.27% to 14.99% that month. Oh, yes, you're right. Was that everything? Yes, basically it is. OK. And can you check my payment? Oh, yes, I'll do it. Can I phone you back? I'll be at home for the next two hours. I have to leave at 11. Right. What's your number? 020-7989-7182. Hold on. 020-7979? No, it's 7989 and then 7182. So it's 020-7989. 7182. Yes, that's it. OK, I'll phone you straight back. Thanks. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. So, Enrique, have you started your research project on cities yet? I've done a bit of reading around the topic and made a few notes. But, if I'm honest about it, I really haven't done as much as I'd have liked to because I'm finding it a bit difficult. You don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. I feel the same way. I think the key is to be able to make valid research questions. You're probably right about that. Didn't we have some lectures on how to write research questions? I think it was towards the beginning of the term. Yes, we did. I've got my notes somewhere in this file. I tell you what, why don't we look at the notes together and then try and come up with some research questions? At least that would be a good starting point. Give us some sense of where we're going with this. Brilliant idea. Let's get started. OK. From what I remember, a good research question is all about knowing from the outset what it is you're trying to find out. Yes. And now that I'm looking at my notes again, I see I've written here that it's to do with understanding and Evaluation. So, understanding a particular issue and evaluating any problems around it. And of course, a very important part is not overlooking any research that has already been done. Past research is just as important as what is being done now. It's a bit, I suppose, like looking at the research that's already been done and seeing if it agrees or disagrees with your own ideas. Mm, sure, I hear what you're saying, 
But to do that properly, you have to have a clear idea in your head what your own research question is, and by that I mean、uh, specific areas you want to focus on. Let's face it, there's so much information out there, and we can't possibly include it all in two thousand words.、Oh, don't remind me. The thought of writing two thousand words at the moment seems like a huge mountain to climb. I know, but let's try to make a start. I think we're meant to be identifying what makes a successful city, and also try to explain why there has been such a steady population movement of people from rural to urban areas. But I'm a bit confused because. I don't think this is meant to be the main focus of our research.、Mm. Perhaps that's why the lecturer said we need to write questions, and that must be our starting point. Okay. Well, what we're investigating is more than simply what elements make a city successful, but we're also trying to offer possible explanations. So we have two questions: Why do people want to move to cities? And why do people choose to live in them? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay then, I think the first issue concerning successful cities must be the economy.、Uh, people move to cities for better job prospects, and successful cities are cities that have thriving economies. That's true enough. It does mean that cities can offer good job opportunities, which seems to me. To suggest that a city will only be successful if it attracts the right kind of people to work there. What kind of person are you talking about? Well, I suppose I'm referring to the skilled labour force. You know, the idea that up-and-coming young people will move to cities, settle there, maybe buy property, and so that city will get the most talented, creative minds. But. If a city doesn't offer this, then obviously it will lose out, as university leavers will choose elsewhere. You could be right there, but I also think that when cities encourage businesses to develop, then you obviously have money pouring into the city, which can raise the general standard of living. So we've definitely got a question worth investigating. But. Apart from the economic factor, I think another point worth mentioning is the environment. Sure, we can research areas like the quality of the air, how clean it is, and then there's traffic. Um, is there too much traffic? How is it controlled? And also the issues of noise pollution and how the city manages its waste. Um, oh, and I nearly forgot. The environment includes green spaces like parks. Those are all valid points, but I think you've overlooked the whole issue of beauty. Beauty? Are you sure? What's beauty got to do with the environment? Well, don't you think if you were deciding whether or not you would live in a city, your first impressions would be made with your eyes? So the buildings in a city are really important. If the entire city looks like a concrete jungle, then it's unlikely to make people want to live there, is it? I think successful cities are those which have managed to strike a balance between old buildings and new ones. So, of course, you'd have some buildings reflecting more modern architecture, but others that haven't lost their character and still represent the past. You're right, actually. I've often thought that buildings tell a story, 
I mean, you can tell the history of a place by looking at the buildings. I know exactly what you mean. And let's not forget that the environment includes cultural aspects. So, for example, what's the cultural life like? For me, a successful city will be attractive because it will have lots to offer, like a good nightlife and a wide variety of places to visit in the day, like museums and galleries, places like that. True, true. My own view is that some cities have an energy about them that are exciting to be in. And other cities are the opposite. <laughs> well, we've covered so much ground here. But I think there's one final aspect we should research. What's that then? The social aspect. Because, let's face it, cities are made up of people. They are. And surely a successful city would be one where there is a sense of community, a place where people would feel safe and want to raise families in. <laughs> This topic is limitless. <laughs> That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old-fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. 
Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh, it's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's... A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world, and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking, and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes, and... Our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault. It's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave, uh, let me... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four.
you will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. Instead of terms up to 13 weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardised test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved. And this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.